All right. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is John Clements. I'm the technical lead for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center. Just a little bit of background if you're unfamiliar with HDIAC and our mission. Uh, HDIAC is a contractor run, um, but uh, uh, government funded organization, falls under the Defense, Defense Technical Information Center. And our goal is essentially to fuse information, scientific and technical information, to the defense. Uh, research and engineering community. And uh, that includes our industry and academic partners. And we do this in a number of ways. And one of those ways is by producing uh, monthly webinars such as this one. So, um, and this is just uh, these webinars. The goal is to get this information out to the community at large, um, ongoing research and ongoing efforts throughout the Department of Defense. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody to um, this webinar, the Department of Defense role in the Committee, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, uh, CFIUS, as I've been calling it. And um, uh, we have two presenters that are going to be uh, discussing this with you through the presentation. Um, just a couple quick admin notes ahead of time. Uh, for one, if you're dialed in on the phone and you can't see the slides, uh, do not worry, we will be posting this up on YouTube at, at the end. Um, so by tomorrow, there will be a follow-on email that will come out and announcing where, where the link is to, um, to access this webinar. So you'll be able to see the slides. Uh, there is quite a bit of graphics on the slide. So I, um, you know, my apologies for those that are dialed in that, that we don't, uh, if you don't have a read ahead. Um, number two, at the top middle of your screen, there's, uh, there is a audience question and answer panel. And if you go up there, you can use, you can click add new question and that's where you can submit questions. So we, we don't have a, um, a live voice chat where you can interrupt and ask questions. But if you have, uh, any question, ask it there and, um, I will be able to kind of filter through those. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A period with the with the two presenters. Um, also, there is an attendee chat. But if you put your question in there, I will uh, monitor that. But the, um, the best way is to go up to that audience question. But if you have, um, you know, just want to chat with the with the audience at large or, or see, uh, you know, who's working on what. Uh, please feel free to use that attendee chat, but that won't necessarily be monitored by me. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our two presenters. Uh, on the line, we have Mr. Ike Blanton. He's the Deputy Director for International Strategic Engagement in the Office of Foreign Investment Review. And Ms. Lirio Aviles, um, the Director of Technology and Industrial-Based Protection and Promotion in the DOD Office of Technology and manufacturing industrial base. So um, with that, Ike and Lirio, uh, you can take it away. Great, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, I, I just wanna say I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak with with all of you about, uh, about these issues. And very excited to be here with Lirio to, um, to discuss this topic. Uh, wanted, as far as a brief introduction, I, uh, as, as introduced, I am the Deputy Director for International and Strategic Engagement at DOD's Office of Foreign Investment Review, uh, which is DOD's representative to the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS. As uh, in this role, my job is to uh, to conduct and do outreach with uh, with the community and also with our foreign partners to raise awareness of uh, foreign investment issues, but also to assist uh, partners and allies in developing their foreign investment review systems. I've been in this role for about two years now. Uh, prior to that, I was with the Department of State as a foreign service officer and served in Brazil, China, uh, the White House Situation Room, the Office of uh, Intelligence and Research, and also worked on China issues. Uh, so with that, I wanted to hand it over to Lirio for an introduction as well. 
Good morning. My name is Lidia Viles, and I'm the Director of Technology Industrial Based Protection and Promotion with the Research and Engineering Office. First, I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today to talk about CFIUS and the work that we do in the department. Um, I'm not going to give you a lot of information about um, what we do, but I wanted to talk with you a little bit about the presentation today. Um, Ike is going to be providing most of the presentation today from the technical part. And I'm going to be supporting in terms of talking about uh, our experiences as a member of DOD, as a stakeholder in the review of foreign investments. This is a very interesting topic, and we have been doing a lot of collaboration between all the different offices in DOD. And we are very excited about sharing some of that information with you. Um, one thing that I will ask you is to free Feel free to ask me any questions that you can have related to r &E participation uh, in any of the areas that we will be presenting today. And I think that's it. I yeah. you can. I Great. Thank you so much, Lirio. And again, thank you for inviting me here to talk about CFIUS and to uh, introduce this subject. And uh, I'm happy to be here with you and with uh, with everyone that's on the line. And thank you again for joining. So as far as today's agenda, the, we'll start off with uh, really what are the threats from adversarial foreign, uh, foreign capital and adversarial foreign investments, because that uh, constitutes the foundation of the why do we do this? And then we'll uh, get into more of the mechanics and uh, and the operations of uh, U.S. Foreign Investment Review, including an overview of CFIUS, uh, the uh, modernization of CFIUS through FIRMA, which is the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act. And then we'll go into a uh, deeper role in CFIUS processes within DOD and DOD's role in the overall committee. Um, so uh, with that, I get, we can move on to slide three. And, and what we're trying to convey here is that uh, national are, are threats to national security uh, and the defense industrial base happen through multiple means and multiple avenues. There's transactional threats that uh, include FOCI, which is foreign ownership, control, and influence. Uh, there's access uh, and forced transfer to intellectual property, and there are multiple export control gaps. So we bucket those into transactional threats. And then there's human threats and human intelligence threat, including talent and talent recruitment, exploitation, and uh, and other avenues. And then cyber threats that uh, I mean we're all well aware of the uh, the the control and influence and uh, and uh, uh, place that cyber holds within all of our institutions and the the threats that uh, that can happen through through that mechanism and as these vectors um, work with our adversaries they they focus on several targets including the defense industrial base our academic institutions and our financial institutions and adversaries aren't limited to just one of these. They they tend to use these uh, vectors and these targets uh, with in multiple ways in that it, they're not limited to uh, merely um, a, a a venture capital investment in a firm. They will also attempt a cyber intrusion on that same firm and possibly talent recruitment through human uh, uh, human intelligence or human uh, solicitation uh, in that area. And th th that type of uh, combination of vectors is what makes our work uh, so important, but also so simultaneously difficult. And that uh, each one of these areas 
areas uh, represents a very large attack surface that uh, our adversaries or that any um, any country or organization can use to access intellectual property, uh, know-how, and or any other type of good or service that they're trying to uh, to get. Um, so then uh, on the next side, what what do we do as far as protection goes, and what are what are why are we protecting these things? And that is that the United States is uh, a, a, has the majority of innovation hubs in the world, and along with our partners and allies, we represent the uh, the the largest uh, and uh, most sustainable uh, group of of innovation hubs within the world, and these these tech, the technologies and innovation and uh, and resources that come out of these are not only important to our economy but also to our national security. And um, moving to the next slide, um, which gets a little bit more specific into what uh, DOD does with CFIUS or the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. We work with uh, foreign direct investment. And when, when we say we protect, uh, uh, um, that CFIUS is there to protect from adversarial or foreign direct investment that uh, is uh, contrary to U.S. national security interests. We also, there's a flip side to that, and that is that foreign direct investment in the United States is an overall positive to the United States. Not every foreign investor and not every foreign piece of capital that comes into the United States is adversarial. And not every investor from a foreign country means to do harm to the United States or means to, uh, to affect and uh, have a negative effect on U.S. national security. Overall, F foreign direct investment supports millions of jobs in the United States, increases our R&D spending by billions of dollars, and adds billions of dollars to U.S. exports. And overall, foreign direct investment is consistently approximately 20% of our, our GDP. So uh, I, I don't want to uh, miss um, the, uh, uh, throw out uh, the good with the bad in that that's what CFIUS's job is, is to separate uh, malintent from uh, our malign intent from positive intent. And uh, I want to continue to reiterate that foreign investment in the United States is an overall positive and has an overall positive impact on our economy and our national security. So, uh, Lirio, I just want to um, offer you, I, I know I've gone through a few slides, I wanted to offer you the opportunity to see if you had any comments or anything so far. No, I, we are pretty much in agreement that uh, it's a positive area if we look at it, if we are looking at promoting competition, and it's very positive in terms of opening the doors to new markets and customers. So yes, we agree in general. Uh, we look at it as a positive uh, thing. We, we are only concerned for those cases that raise national security. Right. So, great. So, moving on to the next slide, slide uh, six. Uh, so, FDI and strategic economic competition. So, I, I think that this slide uh, really connects well with the next slide, the uh, Chinese tactics slide, it, it, because foreign direct investment, uh, as we said and as I reiterated and as Lirio reiterated, is overall uh, a very positive um, thing for the United States and for our allies and partners. However, some countries leverage FDI and foreign direct investment to gain access to new capabilities, gain access to, um, to people, uh, processes, 
patents and um, gain access to uh, the defense industrial based supply chain. With that, uh, we have, over the last 10 or so years, seen an increase in Chinese investment in the United States, and a significant amount of that investment, uh, as Chinese leaders have publicly said, is meant to distort market forces. And uh, the, uh, we strongly believe that um, this is a sustained strategic uh, campaign for competition across multiple areas, economic, diplomatic, and technological, and that the United States needs to balance economic prosperity with national security. Um, the, th this goes along with uh, U.S. companies, um, their the greatest asset of U.S. companies is intellectual property, and the United States, uh, by, by far more than any other country, has a much greater exposure to uh, to intangible assets. In other words, intellectual property, and um, and Chinese foreign direct investment is uh, relatively small into the United States when compared to overall foreign direct investment. Uh, because the United States is and remains the largest destination for foreign direct investment. So uh, if we go to the next slide, and this uh, reverberates back to that first slide we did on threats and risk, these are uh, are some of the threats that the that Chinese um, have used to leverage and uh, gain access to U.S. intellectual property, because Chinese strategic goals are comprehensive national power, uh, an innovation-driven uh, economic growth, and military modernization. In, in and of themselves, those are, are not necessarily um, malintent, but when you combine those uh, strategic goals with uh, with military civil fusion and Chinese R and D strategy, it it leads to an exodus of U.S. intellectual property through any one of these methods, be it academic, academic collaboration, uh, legal and regulatory um, environment, which basically exports, um, and any of the other areas, which uh, some of which. I guess on this slide uh, didn't show up very well. I apologize. Uh, I think there might have been a transfer issue there. But um, one of the key areas there is uh, our front companies and also using um, uh, transactions and acquisitions of U.S. companies. And oftentimes we see that Chinese uh, um, companies are paying a premium for U.S. acquisitions, uh, distorting the market, and uh, often using private equity firms or shell companies or multiple um, uh, multiple ownership structures to obfuscate Chinese involvement in these uh, transactions. So uh, uh, overall, that uh, leads to uh, U.S. Um, suspicions that there is uh, a general uh, purpose for acquisition of U.S. Uh, technology by means of foreign direct investment. In other words, they are using uh, foreign direct investment to gain access to to uh, to the scientists, to the engineers, and uh, to the uh, the people that not only hold the intellectual property uh, as far as uh, patents go, but in a much larger sense, hold the intellectual property to the know-how, the processes, and trade secrets that uh, that make up. Are, uh, that make up a company's strongest intellectual property assets. It, 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 and I, I think that that is often overlooked um, so that uh, be, because a company's, um, a, a company's intellectual property is not limited to its, uh, to its patents. 
a company's intellectual property um, is often found in non-patented forms and includes uh, proprietary information, trade secrets, uh, process like process dev- design, uh, process flow, and th- this type of information is gained. Um, through an organization in a repetitive and consistent and long-term environment with multiple failures. So oftentimes, th- this this type of intellectual property is even more valuable than the patents themselves. And that is really the core structure and the core know-how that is often sought after uh, through an acquisition uh, um, an acquisition, especially an acquisition by adversarial capital, and that is uh, an attempt to uh, to um, to speed up uh, the process and improvement of other uh, of other sources from that uh, that from that capital's source, in which case uh, a large part is Chinese. Um, So uh, I did want to stop there before we get into an overview of of U.S. foreign investment review mechanisms and CFIUS uh, to see if there are any questions. And also, Lirio wanted to see if you had any other comments before we got into the meat of the CFIUS presentation. One thing that we need to consider when when looking at this and, and working in potential transactions is that once we share those specific important areas, they know how, sometimes even they lay out uh, some of the processes. Once we pass that information or share that information, basically it's gone. Basically there's an opportunity for someone to take advantage of that information and and use it in their benefit. So that's one of the reasons that it's very important when when doing these acquisition transactions to think about what is going to be shared, how is that is going to to be used, and and what will be the impact of sharing that information. Yeah, those are. Those are great points. And uh, John, I wanted to see if there were any questions so far to uh, that we might be able to answer. Sure, there's, there's several questions um, that I can bring up and we can start going through. Uh, so the first question that I received, this one here, it's uh, how far down the rabbit hole do we need to go to review these foreign investment companies? Wow, uh, that's a uh, that's a great question because it's one that is is very difficult even for our office with the resources that we have, and uh, I, I take that to mean um, uh, how much due diligence should a company do when they're approached by an acquirer, even if that acquirer appears to be domestic. And I think that a cautious approach uh, and data um, data oriented approach is the best way to go after that. Uh, using open source information, using um, any type of uh, open source database that is available to the company, be it Bloomberg or otherwise. Uh, I don't. That, I, I, as a government employee, I want to state that uh, that is not an endorsement of Bloomberg. It is just an example of one of the many and multitude of databases that are available. Uh, But I think that there is a significant amount of open source information um, uh, available on companies uh, that can be used. And I think requesting that information from the acquirer can often often provide you with some additional background and information, uh, such as uh, requesting the board of directors of the company Company, their names and background, as well as uh, maybe who the financial backers are or owners are of the company. And uh, if you see shell company after shell company, it, uh, I, it's not um, 
uh, those often are used for tax purposes and not just to obfuscate for intelligence purposes. So uh, I, I don't want to, you know, raise uh, un, unwarranted red flags, but I do think that there is a significant amount of work uh, that can be done to vet companies. And uh, again, it's something that we struggle with even here with our resources. Uh, um, Liria, I wanted to see if you had anything to add to that. Yes, I would say for us, uh, the beginning is use open sources. I think there are a couple of questions that you can ask yourself when you are trying to identify additional information through open sources. You can look at what are the, the products that they have right now and what are the markets that they have uh, those products in. Uh, Basically, who are they doing business for the manufacturing lines, the products that they have right now, uh, could be an indication of what they are doing. Also, understanding the reason for the acquisition or the interest in being part of your company will help you to understand better uh, what are the products, where, where are they moving their products, and what potential uh, foreign influence they, they may have. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question. I, uh, is that okay? Yeah, of course, please. Okay. All right, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, what does it mean meant to distort market forces? So what, what that means is uh, the Chinese government in particular is, uh, is using um, uh, its uh, political and economic will to, um, to change uh, or distort the value of things. In other words, they are often um, overpaying for certain intellectual property to gain access to that intellectual property and then produce that thing uh, in China at a lower price because it is subsidized um, by the Chinese government than can be produced anywhere else. So that's usually what we mean by by that. In other words, uh, overpaying for for things in order to uh, increase their own domestic capability in production. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll, I got a couple more here that we can go through right now. Um, this one here. Yeah, there seems to be a growing trend in Chinese investments and or purchase of US companies from an export control perspective do you feel that this may be a way to circumvent the U.S. person directive? Uh, Lirio, I'm going to uh, push that question over to you uh, from the export control side. Could you repeat the end of the question from the export yep. control perspective? Um, did you ask me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, so the question is, there seems to be a growing trend in Chinese investments and or purchases of U.S. companies. From an export control perspective, do you feel that this may be a way to circumvent the U.S. person directive? I think export control uh, can support some of the protections that we have. I think in all the activities that we do, we try to create a balance between protection and promotion. So we want to use our tools like CFUs, export controls, and other different tools for protection with a consideration of what will be the impact to our industrial base and how that will affect uh, our ability to compete, specifically uh, very important in emerging technologies where the technology is relatively new and we want to be sure that we have participation in the market. All right, thank you. And I think we'll do at least one more 
Um, and then may maybe I'll hold the rest to the end. Uh, so this one is when China buys U.S. debt, is there a DOD angle to this? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Are they, I, I think that's referring to, if that's referring to U.S. national debt, I, I'm not sure there's a DOD angle to that. Um, that's out far outside of my lane. If, okay. if we're talking about uh, China purchasing corporate debt, then I think that that's a different question. And oftentimes uh, we've we've seen an increase uh, in Chinese, Chinese purchase of convertible debt. So in other words, debt that can convert into stock ownership. Uh, and uh, that has uh, increased and that is problematic, especially when and if it relates to companies that, uh, that um, produce uh, high t high tech. Okay, thank you. And I uh, will do this one last one. Um, development of emerging technologies are important to establishing and maintaining U.S. economic growth and security. How are emerging technologies protected by the CFIUS process? And this may you may be going over this later in the presentation. So if that's the case, we can defer it. But um, I mean that is the case, and I think it's actually a great um, segue. So thanks for thanks for throwing that softball. Uh, whoever in the audience uh, threw that up, I really appreciate it. Uh, so if we want to go to slide nine, the CFIUS overview process. Uh, CFIUS, uh, as we keep using that acronym, is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. So it's an interagency committee that's authorized by law to review certain transactions involving foreign investment in the United States, as well as certain real estate transactions. And what we're really here today is for critical and emerging technologies and technology companies. And that really falls under the um, up up uh, the um, additional uh, legislation for CFIUS under the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act of 2018, which is also known as FIRMA. And FIRMA added multiple areas to CFIUS, including uh, minority investments in critical and emerging technologies, critical infrastructure, and sensitive personal data. It also added the ability to review certain real estate transactions. Uh, so CFIUS is a uh, CFIUS is a um, has a fairly relatively short timeline. There's a 45-day uh, review period followed by a 45-day investigation, so a total of 90 days. FIRMA uh, also added a declaration filing process, which is a shortened filing, and that is only uh, 30 days. And so uh, uh, with that, in a, and within those 45 and 90-day periods, CFIUS as a committee, uh, represents multiple uh, multiple stakeholders and multiple departments from the Department of Commerce, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, Department of Justice, the Office of Science and Technology of the President, the United States Trade Representative, uh, uh, State Department, and Department of Treasury as the chair. And DOD uh, within that committee structure also has its own set of stakeholders uh, from the um, the various uh, from Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, uh, Space Force, uh, to um, all of the various departments and agencies within DoD as well. So uh, it, the these reviews, uh, while fairly relatively short in period, are reviewed by multiple parties within DoD, and. Um, uh, so moving on to the next slide, slide 10, uh, as far as CFIUS goes, uh, CFIUS's key um, attributes and key and um, primary goal is to protect national security from the risk presented by adversarial capital. And it does this by focusing on the national security risk, not other policy interests like uh, economic security and uh, 
and any other policy interests that might come in. It, it solely reviews transactions from a national security perspective. Each transaction undergoes a rigorous analytical process, uh, understanding that each one is unique. And uh, it, we do this by basing an analysis on the threat, vulnerability, and consequence of the transaction. It's important to note that CFIUS is um, a last resort authority, and a, all other authorities available to the federal government uh, should be considered before uh, CFIUS authorities are engaged. Uh, also important to note is CFIUS is a high, highly confidential process. Uh, CFIUS does not confirm or deny that a case has been before the committee. Uh, all filings with CFIUS are held highly confidential and are not shared outside the committee. And uh, any questions and answers that we ask of the parties are also held very confidential and not shared. Um, as far as CFIUS jurisdiction, and I think this goes to that question where um, uh, CFIUS, traditional CFIUS before FIRMA meant um, any transaction that resulted in a foreign entity taking control of a U.S. business. Uh, and then the next portion is uh, the FIRMA additions where any transaction that results in a foreign entity taking a non-passive investment in a U.S. business that uh, designs, tests, manufactures, fabricates, or develops a critical technology that uh, participates in critical infrastructure or that maintains uh, certain sets of personal data, any uh, investment, um, um, minority investment in those areas are generally reviewable by CFIUS. Uh, FIRMA also added certain real estate transactions that are proximate to military installations or uh, maritime or airports. So uh, going on to the next slide, slide 11, this goes into a little bit more detail on those, I, but uh, go ahead. Yes, Leary, go ahead. I just wanted to, to mention from the previous um, slide, I wanted to give you guys an, an idea of what do we do during the, the review as a DOD stakeholder. Aaron is one of the offices that work with industrial policy to provide inputs and assess the national security uh, potential concerns or risk. Um, so we go through a process internally that it needs to be done fast so we can provide the input uh, to industrial policy within those 45 days. Uh, we do a series of reviews with our subject matter experts, and we include uh, subject matter experts of all the different offices that work with us and different agencies. We have um, sub my subject matter experts from DARPA, from the, the labs, from the different organizations looking at those ca cases and looking at it from a research and engineering perspective, which includes uh, what was mentioned in the, in the previous question, yes, we look at the emerging technologies and that's one element that we consider if this will in some way will impact the development of those technology priorities. And then from there, we create what we call a, an RME consolidated response with our recommendations and, and our complete assessment. And most of the offices that are part of this process do a, a very similar process where they go to their subject matter experts and from their perspective provide inputs about any security or, or concerns related to the transaction. That's uh, an excellent addition. Thank you, uh, Lirio, for that. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. And um, so on slide 11, um, it, it goes into a bit more detail about the FIRMA regulations and the additional uh, uh, FIRMA legislation that, uh, that added 
certain purview to CFIUS and uh, focusing on the critical technology regulations, uh, all uh, items that are ITAR or EAR controlled or um, certain uh, emerging and critical and foundational technologies under ECRA, which is the Export Control Reform Act that was passed simultaneously with CFIUS. Those technologies uh, fall under the um, uh, fall under the FIRMA additions and expansion of authorities. So with with that, uh, uh, as far as a little bit more background on the CFIUS process, uh, we can go to slide 12. Um, and what CFIUS does is we develop a risk-based analysis that uh, that um, seeks to un understand and identify the risk, which is based on the threat, the vulnerability, and the consequence of a transaction. And once a risk is identified, um, uh, we can either decide to clear the transaction, in which case we identify the risk as so low that there's nothing that's uh, required from there. We can uh, negotiate mitigation agreement to the um, uh, for the parties, or we can recommend prohibition to the um, to the president. And that's another thing I want to um, be clarify is that. Um, CFIUS itself cannot prohibit a transaction. Uh, the transaction must be prohibited by the tr president, in which case uh, the committee itself recommends prohibition to the president. Um, and then once the case goes into mitigation, uh, we develop and negotiate a mitigation agreement with the parties that is effective, monitorable, and enforceable. And then once the parties agree to that mitigation agreement, we continuously monitor those agreements uh, through multiple processes, site visits, third-party audits, uh, government audits, and annual reporting um, that, uh, that ensure uh, um, compliance with that mitigation agreement. Um, and then on the right side is a little bit more detail as far as the review process goes uh, for both the regular filings and declarations. Uh, and then um, on to the, the next slide, uh, uh, what our office does is we engage and develop those risk-based analysis based on uh, multiple factors or buckets, including supply chain assurance, uh, tech transfer, product integrity, co-location, or sensitive data. There's multiple other buckets, um, but these are the main buckets where our uh, DOD's risks um, fall. And again, we do that by, uh, uh, by uh, by looking at the um, threat assessment and developing uh, the vulnerability and consequences from that assessment. We, uh, we try to view and uh, see what, uh, whether the technology is critical to DOD or to national security uh, writ large by understanding the, um, the uniqueness of the technology or uh, whether or not the technology provides an advantage or even has a promising future applications to DOD or to national security event, uh, interests. We also look um, at what, um, what is required to advance um, uh, other technologies or uh, whether the technology itself is used to advance other technologies or to improve or maintain system performance in that area. We uh, additionally um, look to uh, understand whether or not there are substitute technologies available or what specialized knowledge and skills are required to design and manufacture the, the item that the technology falls under. And with all of that, that's really where the DOD CFIUS process uh, is best suited to uh, to protect um, uh, critical and emerging technologies. In other words, if uh, foreign capital and particularly adversarial capital is attempting to uh, gain access to um, certain intellectual property that uh, is included or involved in a uh, in a 
uh, a critical or emerging technology. We evaluate that uh, we evaluate that uh, transaction uh, and that technology and um, and uh, do that in in in, uh, in accordance with and uh, in consultation with uh, R and E, um, which is where uh, Lirio's office is. So, Lirio, I wanted to uh, ask if you had anything uh, you'd like to add to that process and the the protection methodology there. Yeah, so we actually have a couple of questions that we ask to our subject matter experts uh, to understand what what are the potential risks. Uh, one of the main questions is obviously if the technology is critical or not. And if they consider that technology critical, why is critical? And then from there, we try to understand what, what could be the areas of concern with that a specific transaction or the technology. Are we losing intellectual property? Uh, we have a concern about the talent or the critical areas, the design skill, the manufacturing skills, uh, do we have concerns about protection of the infrastructure, uh, what, are, what we consider are the critical capabilities, do we have concerns about uh, our ability to compete, our innovation-based health, um, what, what is specific could be the concerns and consequences uh, of a transaction? And also, we look at how that transaction will have an impact in the technologies that we are developing, or, or it will have a potential application in the future. And with all that combined is when we, we assess completely what, what could be the issues from a research and engineering technology standpoint. So, um, John, I think now's a good time to uh, open it up to any additional questions or further questions. I, I don't want to bore people by reading the slides, uh, but I also understand that some people have been calling in, so I'm happy to go into uh, additional detail. Okay, uh, sure thing. We actually have a, a number of questions that have come in, so um, this is a good time. Uh, let me, here we go. So how successful is the U.S. in using our own FDI, specifically the acquisition aspect, in other countries like China, if, if you guys have any um, understanding of that? So the United States does not, as a government, does not offensively use foreign direct investment to acquire technology. Okay. I, I, I and I, I, like and that goes back, to, I think, to the market, um, uh, the market exploitation uh, question, and uh, disrupting uh, market forces question. John, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to be so, sound so short with you. I just yeah. that's that's I think the uh, or, or short with so short with the question or asker. I, I apologize if it came across like that. I, I I think that that's what's so frustrating about parts of this is the United States does not uh, use uh, these things in an off with on an offensive capability. We do not uh, purposely uh, disrupt market forces to gain a an advantage in the technology area. We do not use foreign, the government does not use foreign direct investment to, um, uh, to acquire licitly or illicitly acquire uh, technology. Um, all of these things are what we mean by um, disruptive and uh, incongruent uh, market forces. Uh, Lyria, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yes, but I, I think one thing to consider is that there are other activities also that we use uh, to support to support research and engineering and the development of the technology. Partnerships with industry and academia is one of the biggest areas that we do we use or one of the biggest tools. We also have collaboration with our allies for 
technology development. So there are other tools that we can use uh, to advance our technology uh, and support innovation. Thank you for putting a positive spin on that for me, Lirio. Right. <laughs> right. Nice. Okay. Um, next question is, is Cepheus Sophie, is looking at the Chinese talent plans, that is, placing themselves in strategic positions to steal technologies? So Cepheus itself uh, is not directly involved in the talent program, although we are quite and keenly aware of the Thousand Talents program and do consider it um, in part and parcel of our review process. Um, and uh, I, 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 but the ta if we go back to one of our previous slides, uh, the talent, uh, the talent acquisition process, I believe it was slide eight. Um, I'll, I'll have to uh, just one moment look that up. Um, but uh, the talent acquisition process is indeed uh, one of the. Um, one of the uh, methodologies that is used to acquire intellectual property. So it's actually on slide seven. Uh, so that is one of these uh, circles, and uh, you have the talent recruitment programs and uh, the use of non-traditional collectors uh, to to acquire these technologies. Great, thank you. Uh, this may be out of your lane a little bit, but um, are there similar efforts in place to monitor foreign investment into non-U.S. companies that may be vulnerable to unwanted technology transfer? So actually, that's quite in my lane as uh, our international outreach. Uh, we we work with uh, uh, we work with our partners and allies on on these sorts of issues uh, consistently and constantly. I, I would note that the European Union uh, uh, two years ago, and then one, approximately one year ago, was the uh, deadline for enactment by members enacted a framework for uh, foreign investment review. Uh, our colleagues in the um, UK uh, just a few, just a couple of months ago, um, uh, enacted the, a uh, National Security Investment Act, uh, which uh, increases and uh, redoubles their efforts to uh, to review national, or the review the national security risk associated with acquisitions. Uh, Canada has the Investment Canada Act. Uh, Japan is very far along uh, and has multiple uh, layers of uh, protection for this sorts of uh, investments. Australia does as well. Uh, New Zealand has recently enacted uh, uh, expansions to their investment review. Uh, uh, so I, I, and I don't mean to uh, not call out or uh, or uh, name uh, other U.S. allies and partners as well, because I, it's just that the list would be so long that uh, this is definitely something that would be uh, if you forgive me a bit in vogue and that it's something that's coming to the attention of partners uh it's coming to the attention of allies and uh and everyone is seeing their uh their intellectual property their industrial base uh being purchased um and used by foreign uh foreign capital and particularly adversarial capital so there are plenty of uh countries with uh, with uh, these type of uh, laws that um, that protect them from from uh, foreign investment uh, uh, from that's contrary to their national security interests. Additionally, we work with our foreign partners uh, on these sort of things by sharing trends and analysis on these cases as well. Very good. Thank you. And uh, next question. This seems to be focused on established publicly traded companies. How do you handle foreign investment in startups and privately held companies? 
Yeah, so uh, I, this is not uh, f actually focused on uh, established uh, publicly traded companies. Uh, this uh, CFIUS uh, is and looks at and looks for investments uh, across the board and across the corporate size range, for everything from very small businesses to very large businesses. We uh, have an entire team that's devoted to finding uh, uh, those types of acquisitions that wouldn't normally show up on the front page of the uh, of whatever financial newspaper you you'd like to name, um, but uh, we we consistently look for and look at those transactions, and I would say that they actually those types of transactions make up the bulk of our reviews. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, going down to the next question I have here. Sorry, having a little bit of an issue with the with the window here. Um, sorry, there we go. Apologies. All right, how has stakeholder engagement helped the CFIUS process? What are the potential gaps that need to be mitigated to make the process more efficient? Uh, Lirio, I might, uh, as as a stakeholder, I don't want to speak for our stakeholders, so I might uh, ask you to to address that question. Uh, you know, understanding that this is a public audience as well. Yeah, so I think uh, having these engagements, at least we do training internally with our subject matter experts, gives you a bigger vision more understanding of what the process uh, requires, what are the things that we are looking at, and it also opens uh, the conversation about what are the potential risks, what are the potential analysis that can be done to determine the risk, etc. So I think it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to, to be aware of the possibilities, understand the consequences, and provide the, the information needed to, to evaluate the cases. Like we said before, uh, we are always looking at this from the perspective of balancing the protection but and also the promotion. We understand the importance of having a healthy industrial base, so communication with our industry, with our partners, with academia is very important uh, to to understand what, what could be the issues, but also to look at opportunities to promote our industrial base and promote our uh, innovation, our technology. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it, uh, it was great. Um, I'll move on to this next question. Uh, and in the interest of time, this may be our last question, um, depending on how long the answer goes. But how, how does CFIUS define what counts as an emerging technology, given that the Commerce Department has not advanced many emerging tech export controls pursuant to ECRA? Uh, so... Uh, under current legislation, uh, CFIUS's definition of export controls is uh, tied to and wedded to that definition uh, uh, regarding any changes, uh, potential or otherwise, to that law. I would I would not comment on that, but uh, would ag agree with the premise of the question. Okay, and then there's one more, and I believe you did touch on it, but I'm, I'm going to put it up here. Um, the uh, inquirer actually acknowledged it, it may be discussed in later slides, and I believe you did, but uh, how much time does CFIUS have to make a determination as to whether an acquirer is in the best interest of the U.S. government, and is that sufficient time to properly vet the company? This includes looking at shell companies, et cetera. Yeah, so it's a 45-day period followed by a 45-day uh, review. 
So there's an initial 45-day investigation, and we do consider it a, uh, a sufficient period of time, the 90 days, because we, it is not just the Department of Defense looking at this. We are working with the uh, all of our stakeholders within the DOD, but also with the intelligence community and, uh, and all of our partner agencies and departments on the committee itself. Uh, in, in addition to that, one thing we didn't really touch on is that the committee can ask any question of the parties, and they're required to answer fully and completely within two days. So we we use that to really um, uh, get down into the ownership structure and uh, any financial ownership or control issues or influence issues that might arise uh, from the transaction or within companies. We use that question period to really get into that information. And it is, we do view the answers as very much a trust but verify process and that we look to uh, verify and understand the completeness of the answers. And just if there's not enough of, uh, from that, any wrong answer uh, on a CFIUS, uh or incomplete answer, uh, if it's deemed material to the CFIUS process, it can cause the case to be re-reviewed if we find out about that. So um, just uh, there's definitely an interest for the parties to answer completely and honestly, and we work with the full power and authority of the U.S. government to ensure that they're doing so. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to 1 p.m. So out of respect for everybody's timelines, uh, I'm going to have to end it there. There's a couple of questions we did not get to. Uh, so what I will do is put them together in an email and I will send them over to um, Crystal, Ike, and Lirio to see if they can provide answers. And I can try to provide them via email um, since I, everybody registered. I can try to provide them back to the inquirers specifically. Fortunately, the group doesn't get to hear the whole answer, but at least um, the person that, that asked the question will get it. If you have any further questions and want to get in touch with um, the people that uh, provided the the overview here, um, you can always reach out to me. My name is John Clements, and you can reach out to contact at hdiac.org, and I can um, reach out to them and get you guys in touch with each other. If you have further questions or, or think that you can bring something to the table, um, that's what uh, these webinars are all about, is, is trying to create more collaboration across the communities. Um, uh, Ike or Lirio, do you have any uh, parting remarks? I just, just want, want to, to thank every... You. Oh, go ahead, Lirio. Sorry. Go ahead. just want to thank you for putting this together for us and for and thank AC, IAC, and DDIC for, for, for inviting us and give us the opportunity to talk with of you about CFIUS. Yep, just want to reiterate that and thank everyone for your time, your effort, the excellent questions, and for your attention today. I really appreciate it. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you all.